Hi, I'm Paul Sharman with Cambridge In and Around and today I'm at the Cambridge Union Society in the centre of the city which has been a part of student life since its inaugural meeting on the 18th of February 1815. The Society met every week in a small back room in the Red Lion Inn in Petit Curie which has long since been demolished. The current building behind us was opened in 1866 and it was only its half its present size whereas two decades later in 1866, a large expansion opened, including the spaces occupied by the library and the members' bar. The debating chamber where we are now is the society's most famous room. In addition to the weekly debates held here every Thursday in term time, it hosts a variety of other society events. The balcony displays the crests of all the Cambridge colleges, and the stained glass windows feature the images of the society's crest and the year the original building was opened. The Union Bar and Café, also known as 1815, is a central hub of activity in the building on most evenings and is where the result of the debate is generally announced. It also serves as the members' coffee shop during the day where it's a relaxing place for students and members of the public. We have a debate every Thursday night during term time where the students have invited six celebrities to debate whatever the subject happens to be. But in addition, we have two or three speakers each week as well and they uh, cover a range of topics for the students uh, within the uh, arena of arts, sciences, sports and politics, etc. And they are some of the best speakers in the world in their particular arena. In addition to that, of course, as a debating society, we both run and enter a, a range of competitions from local all the way up to international and world championships, etc. But we also run the largest schools debating competition in the world, with over 800 teams from around the United Kingdom and Southern Ireland, etc., taking part. And from our charitable point of view, because we are a charity, we also run a, a series of visits to schools uh, in disadvantaged areas and invite them indeed to come to the Union and to listen to some of our very, very experienced debaters uh, debate and see if we can encourage the youngsters to take up debating. And what's the importance and the relevance of the Union today? Well, if you think about what debating is actually, it's not a Victorian pastime. It actually uh, is something where a youngster listens to what is being argued, looks at the merits of the case, and then confronts that person he's arguing against in a professional uh, and cogent way so he can argue the case. It's a life skill, actually. And it doesn't matter whether you're going to be a politician or a leader of a team of bricklayers, it's actually something very important to the individual. Who's passed through the Union since you've been here? I think a better answer is actually who hasn't <laughs> been here in the last eight years that I've actually been here. And I'd start by saying people like the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who's been here three times, in fact. The Dalai Lama, Vivian Westwood, uh, Robert Downey Jr., Christian Amanpour, Jerry Springer, Tsar, uh, Simon Sachs Koba Gotha of Bulgaria, Joe Brand, Baroness Hale and lots and lots of politicians. It's a hugely diverse range of speakers and perhaps the best debate in my time was in March of 2013 when we had Rowan Williams who was then the Archbishop of Canterbury against Richard Dawkins, the arch-atheist. You were Vice President of the Cambridge Union during your time here when you were studying here. Um, what does the Union mean? What's its significance? The Cambridge Union is one of, in my view, one of the most important institutions uh, that is renowned worldwide for the excellence of its debates. That's what it's well known for. And as a student, I was lucky not only to be a member, but to be on the standing committee and then to become vice president of the union. And I learned so much from my time at the union. I was also privileged to lead the Cambridge Union debating team two years running against Oxford and uh, my opponent, the leader of the Oxford Union debating team, was Michael Gove, and we became very good friends. And what I learned from the Union is just tremendous, and I think it exposes students um, who attend the debates. You learn, you're inspired, you learn to challenge, and you yourself are challenged. You learn communication skills. Basically, the Union is preparing you for life and hopefully to apply what you learn there in your career, whatever you do, for the rest of your life. And so any of us who chose to be members of the union 
engaged with the union, have been enriched by the union, and have benefited for the rest of our lives. And do you see it still in existence in, say, 50 years' time? Well, I look upon the union. We just celebrated our 200th anniversary. And I look upon it, um, uh, if you look at it as a brand, uh, with a brand, you can, you can change its packaging, but the essence will remain the same. So I would say with Cobra Beer, the Cobra Beer liquid should be the same 100 years from now. The packaging may evolve, the advertising may evolve, the communications may evolve, but the basic essence of the product will never change. That's what makes it special. And the same about the union, the debates that take place, the amazing people that come and speak at Cambridge, that environment and the electrifying environment in a good debate where you're learning through challenge and argument and debate is outstanding. And that is the same when I was here in the 1980s as it is today in the Cambridge Union. So that fundamental essence of the union, I think, is priceless and timeless. How does the union finance itself? We have three main forms of funding. Uh, the first is union membership, which is open to Anglia Ruskin and Cambridge universities. Many people think it's just Cambridge. It's not. Uh, we open it. But also to BP, uh, BPP, which is a law conversion firm, which is local to that. We also lease out parts of our building. And we generated sufficient income over the past 15 or 20 years, etc., from that. And last but not least, we have a subsidiary company, which in fact I'm the managing director of, and our job is to run the non-charitable side of what we do, uh, which covers things like weddings, conferences, and of course the bar and the cafe. What's the most challenging moment the union has had in recent decades? I think its biggest challenge probably took place just before I arrived, uh, when there was an argument over the management of the union between the trustees and the senior student officers. So much so was the argument uh, that a number of senior trustees resigned. And indeed, it was threatened at one point that the charity commission might have taken over control of the union. As a result of that dispute, it was decided to create a position of the bursar. And I was actually recruited as the first ever bursar. Do you still see it in existence in, say, 50 years' time? The union has not stayed still. It has, over the last four or five years, uh, looked at the Victorian nature, if you like, of what debating sounds like, and brought in significant levels of uh, IT and AV support. And it is so much so that we actually have four remote control cameras here. We can actually bring in two remote speakers from anywhere in the world into a debate by, by remote. At the same time, we can feed around the building for those who can't get into the chamber what is actually going on. But more importantly, you can be sitting with an iPhone in Hong Kong watching what's going on in here and actually tweeting back to the president who sits in this chair with an iPad and can ask the question on your behalf and get a response for you. So I think we are keeping up with technology. We accept, that, if you like, the presence of what we own. But at 201 years old, etc. And in 50 years' time, I see absolutely no problem at all with us being here. But we might be doing it by hologram at that stage. So my name is James Antel. I study politics and international relations at Magdalen College. So James, what's the Cambridge Union all about in a nutshell? So in a nutshell, the Cambridge Union is about free speech. It's about having debates on topical issues, having speakers who are, who are shaping the world at the moment. Uh, and giving students the opportunity to, to engage with those people. How and why did you become involved? I started coming to union events uh, in my first week here at Cambridge, uh, and I loved them. I was fascinated by the debates, and so decided to, uh, to start coming to committees. Do you think the union will still exist as we know it today in about 50 years' time? I think the union will be around for many years to come. There's that kind of in inherent value in, in open debate and free speech, which will remain valuable uh, for, for a long, long time. Well, before I came up to Cambridge, I'd always known about the union and heard about the amazing speakers and debates that they had. So I was keen to get involved when I arrived. Um, but in my first year, I took it a bit easy. I didn't really do much other than I stewarded a bit. Um, but when doing that, I found out how lovely everyone was here in the committee, um, and I decided that I wanted to get more involved. It seemed like a, a great thing to be involved in. 
How do you feel about organising these amazing events? It must involve a huge amount of work. Well, there's, there's, we really do two main types of events. One of them is speaker events and one of them are debates. So, you know, traditionally we are a debating society. You know, we started 200 years ago doing primarily debates. Uh, and for the past 30, 40 years or so, we've also started inv inviting individual speakers. Um, so we have the executive officer who, along with their team, uh, run a debate committee once a week. And they, so they send a lot of invites out to people to come uh, debate here. And we choose our topics before the, the term starts. So this term, for example, we had uh, this house believes that masculinity is bad for everyone. So we organize those debates uh, about once a week. And then we also try to host speakers. Uh, so that involves you know, inviting a lot, a lot of people. Um, so what I did last term was um, send out a lot of invites with my speaker deputies and people who are on the speaker committee to try to get people to, to come. So it does involve a lot of preparation, but it's really great because obviously you send out hundreds, sometimes thousands of invites, and it's nice to see it. And at the end of the day, you get a you know, concrete result, which is having people like Lord Sugar today to come speak to you, and it, it definitely is worth all the work you put in. What's been the highlights of that? Um, we had Yanis Varoufakis come along. He was he was very um, interesting to listen to. Um, and but last term I was on debates. I helped liaise all the debates, and I really enjoyed just the the process of it all going through and arranging the events and meeting loads of different people. I don't think anything stands out so much above anything else. Just the whole kind of everything together, meeting people, arranging things, and liaising, and just. It all, it all is a highlight. <laughs> what do you see the future of the union? Will it still exist in its current form? Well, I think the reason we've been around for so long and the reason we'll continue to be around for so long is we do something that's essentially very basic but very important, which is promote free speech. So, in, you know, in the past, we've been sometimes attacked for having speakers which were deemed very controversial, but that's what we do. We try to give a platform to people um, sometimes regardless of their views. So our law is that you could enter the chamber and the only rules that apply within the chambers are the laws of this country. And uh, So we try to put people on a platform because we think that it's important, uh, whatever their views may be, to challenge them and give them a platform. That's what we're all about. It's about promoting free speech. And so I think that in the future we'll continue to do that and um, hopefully for the foreseeable future. The union first and foremost was actually a social activity. It's like another student society in Cambridge, a very big one, but it's undoubtedly one of the places I made my closest friends whilst I was here and spent a lot, of, a lot of time with them in the union building and planning the events. But I think what drew us together as a friendship group was that we all had similar ideas. That's why we were involved in the same society. We were interested in similar things, interested in what was going on in the world and ultimately believed that the union was something worth giving a lot of time for. It was an important idea, it was an important society, it was uh, an important thing to defend in Cambridge, particularly at the time when, across different student campuses, the ideas of unconditional free speech that the union stands for are not as universally accepted as they were. The union undoubtedly is another one of those amazing privileges that come with being at Cambridge. We get the opportunity to attract some of the most high caliber speakers to Cambridge and give students the chance to meet them, speak with them, hear them in a very small scale setting, by and large hear them to some extent off the record and get amazing exposure to those people who we might not otherwise ever meet in person. But uh, I think the importance also is part of the dialogue that in uh, official student unions has become a bit one-sided. We've seen in recent weeks, we've seen controversy about the NUS and whether their views are not just representative, but whether they're in fact tolerable at all. And the union historically has provided a bit of a counterweight to that uh, and been a place where ideas that might be excluded through some of student dialogue can still be heard and given a fair, fair airing, whoever the speaker is. I think everyone finds that the union can be a very challenging place. It is, first of all, everyone does the roles for one term only. So every term, everyone is trying to learn what on earth they're doing, which adds certain challenges and does mean we end up reinventing the wheel or forgetting that the wheel existed in the first place quite a few times. But in addition, people are, as I said, all working together for the same thing and people come together um, and you can all, there's always someone there you can rely on. So I had such a fantastic team that, though there were difficult situations, 
by and large, other people made sure that they never came to a head. I'd say the most challenging moment personally was when I was chairing a debate on drugs, but it wasn't a legalization debate. We've had several of those. This was a debate on whether taking drugs is a good idea, whether actually if you were in the decision, should you take drugs? My parents had come up to see the debate and I thought this was no problem at all. But then the first proposition speaker asked me directly whether I'd taken drugs or put me on the spot and started involving me in his speech. And that's definitely a moment where you realize that people are watching you. Um, but for the record, I haven't. There's definitely a feeling when big events come together and people leave chattering, people leave happy, people leave um, and you, you really feel that the event was worthwhile, it was worth the time that you put in to organise it and worth them coming. We, during my term as president, we took a bit of a detour from the usual debate format for just one week and hosted an event on mental health where instead of having an opposition versus proposition debate, we just invited proposition speakers to talk about the motion this house believes we need to talk about mental health and got a range of people from the charity sector uh, people with personal experience of mental health problems, uh, celebrities who had interacted with mental health uh, issues themselves. And everyone spoke so personally, so passionately, and really gripped the audience. And whether by luck or by design, we had such a fantastic range of speakers covering so many different topics. At the end, hearing people's comments when they left that event, that they were so pleased we'd dispensed with the normal format, that they were so pleased we'd managed to have this conversation. Um, I certainly think it was my favourite event in my time here, but also it was immensely satisfying to have organised it. There are some people who you see in the public spotlight, but you don't necessarily get to see them behind the scenes. But when they come and when you chat to them for a bit before they do their event, or if you're interviewing them, or if you take them out for dinner afterwards, they're fantastic. Because you see them light up, you see what makes them tick, you hear things that they'd never be allowed to say on television. Um, so uh, there have been a few amazing examples, but I think Jon Snow was the best for this, because Jon Snow, the newsreader, because he had been in, involved with current affairs and politics and journalism for so long that he knew a phenomenal amount and might know things or might have opinions that he couldn't ever say when he was on Channel 4 News, but chatting to him one-on-one -on -one about his views on politics, uh, chatting to him on things he'd seen, things ex he'd experienced, funny things that go on off camera was absolutely, it was amazing. It was so, so much of an insight that I'd have never got if I'd not got to meet him one-on-one -on -one off camera. Uh, well, I'm Stephen Parkinson. I'm an ex-president of the Cambridge Union. Uh, I was uh, an undergraduate at Emmanuel College uh, from 2001 to 2004 and was president in the uh, Lent term of my final year. Uh, I read history when I was at Cambridge and largely neglected my degree, uh, spending lots of time here at the Union debating or running for election. So after I graduated, um, because I was quite interested in the, the history of the society, uh, I thought I'd make up for neglecting my history degree uh, by doing some proper research into the Union and its foundation, uh, and that turned into a book, uh, A History of the Cambridge Union, which came out in 2009. Okay, so now we'll deal with sort of how and when the Union was founded. Sure. Yeah. So the Union marked its 200th anniversary last year. It was founded in February 1815. Uh, fittingly enough, as the result of a, a row, there were a number of smaller debating societies in the colleges at the time. Uh, it's not exactly clear what happened, but uh, there seems to have been a, a falling out amongst some of the members about who should be the president. And uh, there was a, a, an old Etonian at Trinity called Edward Gambier, who uh, uh, missed out on the top slot at one of those debating societies. So his friends rallied around, they merged uh, the debating clubs and formed the Union, uh, as it became known, uh, and elected him as the first president. Uh, of course, this was um, quite a, a feverish time uh, for a debating society to be starting up. It was uh, towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and the government at the time was very worried about 
uh, sedition uh, spreading around the country. Uh, they passed uh, the Seditious Meetings Act, uh, the Habeas Corpus Suspension Act, uh, lots of sort of crackdown on, on free speech. So a debating society for undergraduates debating topical political motions obviously uh, was not the most auspicious uh, backdrop. So unsurprisingly, within a couple of years, the union found itself in, uh, in hot water. Uh, in 1817, uh, in the middle of one of its debates, the university authorities burst into uh, the debating chamber uh, and demanded that the debate was broken up. Uh, and by one of the quirks of fate of union history, the, the president who was in the chair that night, an undergraduate called William Hewell, uh, actually later went on to be Master of Trinity and Vice-Chancellor of the university. But back then, he was a... Uh, uh, just a, a plucky undergraduate uh, and he stood up very calmly and said thank you to the proctors for coming along and politely asked them to withdraw reminding them that the union was a, a separate club and not part of the university and uh, the debate carried on. I mean the union has always been a bastion of, of free speech right from the beginning um, in those early days where the, the university tried to tell it uh, what motions uh, the undergraduates could debate. Uh, they used to try and get round the uh, restrictions that the university tried to put on them. At one point they were told they couldn't debate any political issue that had been in the news over the last 20 years. So uh, the union simply got around it by adding the words 20 years ago to the end of most motions to make the point that they should be able to debate whatever they wanted. Uh, and certainly since the uh, 1830s, um, they've done it without any restriction whatsoever. Now, down the years, there have been some quite controversial speakers invited uh, uh, along. Um, Oswald Mosley has come to speak on a number of occasions. Uh, he came and debated fascism versus socialism against uh, Clement Attlee in what was a very dramatic debate. Uh, then in the 1960s, he, after he'd uh, led the British Union of Fascists and uh, been imprisoned during the war, uh, he was invited to come and speak to uh, the University Conservative Association uh, by Ken Clark, and that caused quite a row within uh, the Tory Association. The union got dragged into it as the hosts of the meeting, but also because Michael Howard, another uh, future uh, leading light of the Conservative Party, uh, took exception to it, and he actually resigned from the Conservative Association over Ken Clark's invitation to Oswald Mosley, and they ended up standing against one another uh, for election in the union later that term. Michael Howard uh, went on to win. They were both eventually president of the union.